This episode contains discussions that may be disturbing to some listeners or viewers. Discretion is advised. So if you've been with us, you know that we have covered Natalie Holloway in the past. And we are just going to give an update because things have changed since then. Yes, so things have changed. Um, one place that you can see stuff about where things have changed is um, the Hulu show. Impact by Nightline, Natalie Holloway. Natalie Holloway. We were in that episode. Um, but a lot of stuff has changed. So we kind of wanted to do, if you're not familiar with the case, an overview of it. We won't go into quite as much detail as our previous episode. So we do have a full episode that we put out earlier this year, 2023. So like May. Um, and at that time, the new stuff had not happened. So um, you can go back and listen to that episode if you want to get in super, super detail. But we are going to go over everything here especially the things that have been updated yes but especially those yes 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 all right natalie holloway was born on october 21st 1986 to dave holloway and beth twitty and she was the oldest of two she has a younger brother named matthew uh dave and beth divorced in 1993 they both eventually remarried and natalie for the most part lived with beth in mountain brook alabama Dave Holloway described his daughter as being energetic, very kind, someone who do who would do anything for anyone. And she was also an honor student at Mountain Brook High School, as well as a member of the dance team. She was involved in the American Field Service, where she helped exchange students adapt to life in the United States. Very active young woman. Yes. Uh, Natalie had dreams of becoming a mother one day, as well as becoming a doctor. Natalie earned a full academic scholarship to the University of Alabama, and she was planning on studying pre-med. She ended up graduating from high school on May 24, 2005, and it was the last time that she saw her father, Dave, and her stepmother. Stepmother. Hello, Maja. Hello, (laughs) Baja. Wow. Wow. Uh, And her stepmother, Robin. So now we're going to jump to Aruba. On May 26, 2005, Natalie Holloway and her classmates arrived in Aruba for their class trip, which is just insane to me. I cannot believe that that was a class trip. I know that our school did do class trips, but when we would go on trips, which we did not do in high school, if it was not with our own respective families, right? Um, but it was like to, I mean, I've heard of people going to a lot of times, if you're from Tennessee, you go to Florida. You might you might head over to Myrtle Beach. Yeah, yeah. Um, Aruba. Cancun or, you know, something like that. That might be a big trip, but Aruba is, that's pretty big. That's a heck of a trip, yeah. And there were 100 or over 120 students on this trip, and they had approximately seven chaperones. And that's a lot of students for not that many chaperones. Yes, a lot of students. And... There have been plenty of people who have made the comments like, why would you let your child go on something like this and all of those things? A lot of these kids were 18. I mean, you can you can say all day long, well, I would love for you to not do that or I don't feel comfortable. But at the end of the day, they're adults. Yeah, they're going to do what they are going to do. They may need your money to do it at that age if, you know, they're still living at home and all of those things. But I mean, you know. If and, she had I mean, wanted to take a road trip by herself across the country, she could have done it, you know? <laughs> like, Well, and I think it's one of those things, too, where you just, you never, ever suspect or expect that it's going to be you, your kid. It's not going to happen to you. Right. So the group was staying at a beachfront, all-inclusive Holiday Inn resort on the northern end of the island. And at this time, the drinking age in Aruba was 18. So here in the United States, of course, it's 21. So this was an opportunity for the kids to drink legally for the first time. On the last night of the trip, the trip, the trip, the trip, this is May 29th, 2005. Natalie Holloway and some of her friends were at a casino at their hotel when she met a local 17-year-old boy named... Yoron Vandersloot. Bleh. 
all of those names could be great all by themselves, but I hate Joran Vandersloot with all of the fire inside of me. Again, I feel like, which by the way, movie Clue, freaking love it. It's one of my favorites. The flames, flames on the sides of my face. And you know, that was an ad lib. She, that wasn't in the script. She did that all by her lonesome. Did she? And now that's like Madeline such Kong. a huge... Like that's it's the like line. the best quote. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But yeah, yes, like he, he gives me the flames. A hundred percent. And also, this is one of those things where, like, I mean, especially at that age, every boy that you meet is not dangerous, right? Like, none of us were thinking that way. We grew up in the time when chat rooms were starting to get popular. So I remember being in eighth, ninth grade. And I would go to my friend's house and we would sit up late at night and chit chat with dudes online or whatever. You know, you'd be like ASL and you're like 16 female or 13 female, you know, like whatever. We were positive. We were talking to boys that lived in California that were 16. Surfers. Uh huh. As an adult now, I'm like, that was probably a 60 year old man somewhere like, yeah, you know, I mean, you just you don't think about that kind of stuff or like if you meet a boy on vacation. Well, you think that you're having your Olsen twins yes. vacation fantasy where you have met yeah. your soulmate. Yeah, this person can't. Why would they be dangerous? They're around my age, like a 17 year old boy. Yeah. Not what you're expecting. No. Joran was born in the Netherlands, but he was going to school in Aruba. And Natalie and Joran chatted at the casino, and then the group decided to head over to a local bar called Carlos and Charlie's. Natalie and Joran danced. They had drinks together. They were reportedly having a very good time. Around 1 a.m., the bar was closing, so the group decided that they were going to head to another bar. But Natalie decided that she was going to head out with Joran and his two friends, Deepak Kalpo, who was 21 at the time, and his brother Satish, who was 18. The next morning, Natalie's friends could not find her, but saw that her bags, her passport, all of her belongings are still in her hotel room. They notified a chaperone that they couldn't locate Natalie, and they called Beth, Natalie's mom. The flight back home to Alabama took off without Natalie on board. Mm. So Natalie's family immediately jumped on a plane, headed to Aruba, and they were looking for Natalie. They went to the hotel casino first where she had met Yoron, and they actually talked to employees there, and the night manager said, yeah, this guy, Yoron Vandersloot, he comes to the casino a lot. He likes to pick up young girls on vacation. Like, it's kind of his thing, right? And so Beth, uh, Natalie's mom, was like, okay, well, I want to see the security camera footage. Like, I want to check this out. So she sees them talking together, and it's like, okay, well, this may be the last person that saw her. So I need to know what he has to say. I need this information, right? So she calls the Aruban police. And the police and Natalie's family go to the Vandersloot residence where Joran was questioned about what happened that night. Joran's father, Paulus Vandersloot, happened to be there. So he was a lawyer at the time. He was on his way to becoming a judge. And he is very close while all of this is happening. Um, and I think also very, very... Um Important to note that he was very well connected. Very well connected. Very well connected, yes. Yeah. In Aruba. Um, so at first Yoran was like, I've never seen her. I don't I don't know who this person is. Never heard of her. And they keep pressing, they keep talking to him, and then he's like, okay, yeah, I did meet her. But what happened was uh after we left the bar or whatever. We go to um, a lighthouse. We wanted to take her to this lighthouse to watch for sharks. And then we were going to bring her back to the hotel. And so we dropped her off. She's walking inside. She fell and hit her head. Walking inside to the hotel. Um, but she got up and she was fine. And so she walked in. I saw her go inside around two in the morning. And so... I left. Um, and you know who can corroborate this is a security guard that I know well. I don't happen to remember his name or have any contact information for him. But if you would just find him, he would tell you, yeah, she fell. I saw it, too. And she went inside. And of course, nobody's ever able to locate this particular person. The search expanded. 
uh, in the following weeks. So tourists, locals, um, they had United States volunteers, uh, the Aruban police, the Dutch Marines. They had three F-16 fighter planes from the Netherlands all joining in the search for Natalie. On June 5th, the first two arrests were made in the investigation. So two former security guards from a hotel that was closed for renovations at the time were arrested. Uh, Yoron and the Calpo brothers had claimed that they saw a guard approach Natalie outside of her hotel after they dropped her off. So basically, they're like, he did it. I saw him do it. Right. I saw that guy do it. They arrest these two men. They talk to them. They get more information. They realize these two people had absolutely nothing to do with Natalie's disappearance, and they ended up being released on June 18th. On June 9th, Joran Vandersloot and both the Calpo brothers were arrested, and they were held on possible charges of first or second degree murder and kidnapping resulting in death. The Calpo brothers now said, okay, here's what really happened. We, I know you... You can't believe the first couple stories that we gave you, but the, now we're telling the truth. This so was for sure the truth. Jot um, that down. Yeah. And so what happened was we left Natalie and Yoran together, and they were on the beach near the hotel. But so I know we said we saw her walk into the hotel. I know we said we dropped her off at the hotel. I know we said we brought her to this lighthouse. I know we said we brought her here. None of that. Okay. Forget all that. Now, we left them at the beach together, and then we went home. So, I don't know what to tell you. On June 14th, the beach was searched for evidence, but nothing was found. Please do keep that in mind for our confession later. The next day, the Vandersloot residence was searched, and the police ended up seizing two vehicles. They took computers. They took cameras. Paulus, Yoran's father, was questioned, and then he was arrested on June 22nd, uh, along with a party boat DJ who had been reported to have connections to Natalie's disappearance. And I think the thought process there was that Yoran did something to Natalie. Paulus helped to cover it up. And this party boat DJ helped would dispose have, of the body. Yeah, helped dispose of the body, take the boat and bring her out to see and Indeed. dispose of the body. Uh, but they were both released on June 26th. Another search was done in August after a tip that a sonar machine had detected human bones, but the divers found nothing. A pond near the Marriott where the gardener had seen the boys was also drained, but again, nothing came up. Six weeks after Natalie's disappearance, her family had put up a reward of $200,000 for her safe return and a reward of $100,000 for any information about what happened to her. And by the end of July 2005, the reward for her safe return had been increased to a million dollars. That is just so heartbreaking. They're like anything to get her back. And Beth, I mean, both parents did as much as they could. But of course, they live in Alabama Mm -hmm. or if you're us, Alabama. Mm -hmm. But they flew and Beth stayed in Aruba for a long time. A really long time. Yes, they both did what they could. But Beth was there. Yeah. Absolutely. In in February of 2006, a suit filed with the Supreme Court of New, New York accused Joran Vandersloot of, quote, malicious, wanton, and willful disregard of the rights, safety, and well-being of Natalie. It claimed that Paulus enabled Joran's predatory behavior, but it was dismissed. In December of 2006, the Holloways filed a wrongful death suit against the Calpo brothers in a Los Angeles Superior Court. Unfortunately, the location made it unable to go through, and a judge dismissed it over the lack of jurisdiction on June 1st, 2007. There's just so many things that... I mean, they're completely helpless. Yes, that work against the Holloway family in this case. It's just awful. Okay, so in November of 2007, Yoran and the Calpo brothers... uh, were arrested again because of, quote, new incriminating evidence. They were charged with involvement in the voluntary manslaughter of Natalie Holloway or causing serious bodily harm to Natalie Holloway, resulting in her death. Unfortunately, the evidence that was uncovered was not enough to move the case forward, and they're all released. So then Yoran does a bunch of stuff that's not like 
suspicious or, yeah at all none none of that so he ends up moving to bangkok he buys a restaurant and lo and behold he is investigated for the sex trafficking of thai women he posed as a man named murphy jenkins he told all these women that he was a production consultant for a modeling agency. And he promised that these girls that he was finding and approaching and all of these things were going to go to Europe and they were going to do modeling. They're going to become the next, you know, like America's next top model sort of thing. Um, he allegedly received $13,000 for each girl that he sold. That's disgusting. That sentence for each girl that he sold. Sold. Oh, my gosh. Then, unexpectedly, Paulus, Joran's father, died of a heart attack in February of 2010. And at this point, people around Joran said that he was spinning out of control. He was drinking all the time. He had gotten really into drugs. Like, the death of his father really affected him in a negative way. He, I would say he was already out of control because he's not only doing drugs himself, but we know that he was drugging women. Mm -hmm. You know, he, the, that was one of his favorite things to do was go out and find tourists and drug them. Yeah. And you could apparently pay the bartender, what was it, $20 to drug your date? $20. Like, and he, he did this all the time and he did this with friends. It was a thing that like they did as a group. You know, mm -hmm. the uh, the oxygen special. What was it? A six part series? It was six parts. Yes, it sure was. Terrible. Exploitive all the way around. But they talked to one of his friends at the time and he talks about them doing that all the time, that that's what they did. And they would go and like they would they would rape these girls together. How like what I don't understand is. It's bad enough for one person to do something like that. I just can't imagine that as a friend group, you guys are all hanging out. Everybody's having fun or whatever. And one of them says, hey, let's go drug girls and rape them together. We'll take turns. Yeah. And everybody's like, oh, great idea. Let's go do it. Let's do it. Like, you know, I hadn't thought of that, but that that works for me. All right, let's go do it. Like, how does that happen? How do you broach that subject with a friend? You know what? I I have met different or I've like, you know, kind of been involved in different friend groups over the years and stuff. And sometimes I'm like, man, they don't really like to do what I like to do all the time. You know, like they don't like to they don't want to go um, tape shopping and, you know, things like that. But it's never been like a man. I just I really can't find a group of people. It's hard enough to find people that want to do stuff that you want to do. That's not illegal and morally bankrupt. But I don't know how you find this group of people that's like, yeah, they love raping as much as I do. Mm -hmm. Finally, mm -hmm. I finally found a rape buddy. Yeah. A and multiple. It's not even just like Two One people person. got together that were just terrible people. And yeah, it's like several. I mean, Yoran surrounded himself with men who were into sex trafficking and date rape and violence against women. And I just don't understand how that even comes about. It's well, and it very confusing to me. It makes me think of that quote from Friends when Ross is talking to. Um, <laughs> to, he's talking to Rachel about Mark, remember? And she's like, he's just being nice. Like, he just wants to be helpful. And uh, Chandler ends up making out with Joey's sister, but he can't remember which one. And Ross is like, you think you think you know men? This is men. And it's <laughs> like, because he can't, you know, it's like, is that just how men? No, that can't be. There is no way that all men are like this. But how are there this many men that are like how this? How are there this many? Yeah, we covered the one serial killer and I cannot remember. It was always oh, the duct tape killer. Um, oh, yeah. Wasn't it where he he would like hang out with his friends or whatever and he started kind of making like jokes casually at first and was like, Oh, man, it'd be really fun to, like, if a woman is pulled over on the side of the road and needs help, pretend like I'm going to help her and then hit her over the head with a tire iron yes. and take her back somewhere and torture her and, like, rape her and stuff like that. And his friends were like, I thought he was just joking. I'm like, I'm sorry. How does that come out of somebody's mouth and you don't 
immediately report them throw to the alarm police bell. or something. Yeah, like yeah, like we don't, don't do wanna, that. Yeah, I don't want to have a friend that even jokes like that. No, and then he would ask this guy, "Okay, well, let's do it together." Let's go out hunting for a woman. And he'd be like, I didn't think he was serious. And then they get in the car and they go hunt for a woman and he attacks somebody. And he's like, yeah, I, I went along with it a couple times, but like. That wasn't that wasn't what I wanted to do. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, you know, sometimes your friends want to do something and like you don't exactly want to do it, but you do it because you're friends with them. And like, no, guys, this is not. This is not we go along for the ride kind of stuff. Well, okay, exactly. And like the only experience that I have with doing something that a friend wanted and I had no idea what was going to happen, but I get in the car with her and then we end up at her f-ing dentist's office for hours because you shouldn't ha- you shouldn't bring a friend with you to the dentist. It takes too long. It's too much of an imposition. That's the only time where I was like, man, I, just, I, I had to go along with it. You know, like I, I couldn't do anything about it and mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. That's. That's something that, again, is putting your friend out. So don't do that to people. But also, that's not, I just, are we, do we live in bizarro world? Like, I know, just the amount of, because there's so many cases that we've covered where it's like, if multiple people are involved in the perpetration of just about any crime, it's going to come out because somebody's going to feel so guilty, right? And they're going to tell somebody or they're going to, you know, or or they just can't keep their mouth shut. Like, they're going to say sure. something. But in this situation, it was like everybody that he was around was just like, yeah, let's let's rape tourists. Let's go pick them up. And and for sure, let's just like get a bunch of them together in a hotel room and rape them. Hell, let's sell them. I mean, that's thirteen thousand dollars I wouldn't have otherwise. Like. Oh, my God. I could I could even like it's kind of scuzzy, but like if you were doing a. um. Henry Roth from Fifty First Dates thing where you like go after all the tourists that come in just for like a one night stand type of situation. Like, okay, whatever. I don't yeah, know. Or like sure wedding crashers. Happens. Yeah, being like right. going to weddings or whatever. It's like yucky, but yeah. But it's not illegal. It's not illegal. Right. So. Because consent is sexy. Exactly. Very, very sexy. So that's your, I mean, this is just, this is what he does for fun. His mm-hmm. hobbies include date rape, violence against women, and sex trafficking. What the fuck? Um, so his dad passes away. Now all hell breaks He's, loose for him. Yes. I mean, it gets worse. In March of 2010, Yoran decides, you know, it would be a great idea. I'm going to email Beth Holloway's attorney, John Kelly. And I'll tell them that I will reveal the location of Natalie's body, but I want $25,000 up front, and then I want another $225,000 afterwards. So they bring the FBI into this. On May the 10th, John Kelly took $10,000 to Aruba and met with Yoron. Yoron takes him to a house and says that his dad, Paulus, who's now dead, buried Natalie Holloway in the foundation of this house. So here you go. Here it is. I mean, just threw his dad under the bus. Yeah. No questions asked. Like, whatever. He's like, well, I mean, he did it. What What am I supposed to He's do? He's not here to defend himself and uh, say that he didn't. So. Exactly. And so send me my money. So they wire him another $15,000 to his bank account in the Netherlands. Of course, this was not true. They were unable to recover anything. And actually, that house was not even built at the time of Natalie's disappearance. I do remember you mentioning or saying before, like, how stupid it was that he had asked for that fraction of the amount in the beginning because it's inevitably either... It pays you, you produce the goods, you tell the truth. And even after that, it's like, okay, well, boom, arrested probably. So you're not going to get the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Or you are proven to be a liar, which you absolutely are. Um, So I'm not sending you any more. No. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's definitely very interesting that he was like, but obviously he was super desperate for money at this point. His dad's gone. He's his whole life up 
left, right, and center. Like, he's just desperate for any kind of money. So he asked for 25000 Like, you know, he probably could have asked for fifty or a hundred, or, you know, I mean, right. up front. He, thank goodness he didn't. But yeah, he didn't because that you, I mean, exactly. You know for a fact when you sent this email that you're not giving them the correct information. Either you had nothing to do with it and you don't actually know where it is, or you had everything to do with it and you know where everything is. And you know damn well that's not the spot. So, like, for sure you're not going to get that money after. They're no. going to figure that out. Yeah, they're not going to be like, well, I mean, it didn't work out the first time, but here's some more money. We'll just throw, keep throwing money at it until we get the answers. It just, yeah, does not make any sense. And, you know, this is really coming from Beth's side. So, Beth is really the person who has been extorted at this point. And so... They're like, well, he's going to get arrested, right? Because that's extortion. Like, boom, arrested. N- matter of time now. Like, in no time flat, he should be arrested. But that didn't happen. It didn't happen. So whatever did happen, now the different authority agencies will give different reasons why nothing happened during that period of time, why they weren't able to arrest him right away and all that kind of stuff. But while they were getting their ducks in a row or whatever, Yoran takes that money and he goes to Peru. Gone. Are you in an OFT? Yep. Oh. And I swear, one of the, I mean, this guy, obviously, Yoran, he has absolutely no moral compass. He has no, he's, again, morally bankrupt, has nothing. And maybe, I don't know, I'd like to think that people can change. But I, from what I've seen of Yoran, not looking likely. No. Two. Not only be responsible for the disappearance of someone's child, but then to turn around and be like, I know where she is, but I'm not going to tell you unless you give me money for it. And then Big Fat not do it again after that. There is a special place in Michigan for that man. Amoebas on fleas on rats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While in Peru, five years to the day after Natalie Holloway went missing, Yoran Vandersloot killed Stephanie Flores Ramirez in his hotel room in Lima, Peru. Yoran confessed to killing her after she had used his computer to look up Natalie, which he claims enraged him. And there are different reports of what exactly happened there. Um, If she looked up Natalie, if she brought up Natalie, if she, I don't know exactly what happened there. And it's five years to the day. So you would think that some publications are running a, it's been five years. story. Yeah. Since Natalie Holloway disappeared. Yeah. And I mean, I think, I think he was looking it up on his computer. I think he had it up on his computer. So what happened with Stephanie is he does the same thing he did with Natalie. He meets her in the casino. In the hotel, they get and to talking. Yoran was very big into gambling. He was very big into what poker, right? Yeah. So, and he did like tournaments and stuff. Like, yes. So, if you were looking for him, you could find him most likely in the casino. Yeah. And so he's chatting her up. They get to talking, and then they go up to his hotel room. And I wonder if because he loves the attention, he loves the. I think he likes reliving the crimes and like that kind of stuff. So I wonder if he had it pulled up on his computer because it's the five year anniversary and people are running stories on it and she saw it or something like that. And then she's like, realizes, yeah, I'm in the same room with somebody who may have murdered another girl and she tries to get away and then he beats her to death. Or... I mean, it could have nothing to do, like, this is all coming from him, so who knows. But yeah, she exactly. he could have propositioned her. She said, no, thank you. I'm mm-hmm. not interested. And then he just. Right. Because he's saying she looked through his computer, which enraged him. But we know what enrages him. And that is being told no. Mm-hmm. He will fly into a rage. Pure, unadulterated rage to where. I don't know. He might beat someone to death when he is turned down for sex. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're right. The more likely story there is that she was like, no, thank you. Yeah, I'm not interested. He couldn't deal with that. Yep. 
He was arrested and sentenced to 28 years in prison for Stephanie Ramirez's rela- uh, murder, and he was also ordered to pay $75,000 in reparations to Stephanie's family. On June 27, 2010, Yoron was indicted for wire fraud and extortion in the United States for his attempt to get the $250,000 from Beth. It was said that authorities didn't arrest him immediately after he received the wire payment because there wasn't, quote, sufficient evidence to do so, which is really, really fucking frustrating because had they had sufficient evidence and arrested him as soon as this happened, Stephanie would still be alive. Yes, exactly. And Beth is really vocal about that. I mean, she did everything that she could to get him arrested for this. Like, she brought the FBI into things immediately. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's jurisdictional whatever because he's in Aruba and she's in the United States and, like, all these things. But can we not have a pissing contest? And can we please just do what needs to be done? Because now he's fled and he's killed somebody else. Absolutely. And the fact that it's five years to, to the day later that he did this too is mm-hmm. it, it's not lost on me the significance of that well exactly and he is the kind of calculating person that would get a kick out of something like that absolutely oh yeah. here's what i'll do i'll do this five years to the day mm-hmm. it'll be my day yep Ugh. natalie holloway was declared legally dead on january 12 2012 in July of 2014, Joran Vandersloot married his then-pregnant girlfriend, and she has since given birth to their daughter. Joran was then transferred from his prison to another prison with rougher conditions after allegedly threatening to kill the warden in the first jail. Yeah, He's so... Just a gem, isn't he? Yeah, he went and fucked all that right up because the first he jail that he was cushy. in... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was able to wear street clothes. He could pretty much do whatever he wanted. He was having conjugal visits. Mm -hmm. He was able to impregnate his girlfriend, now wife. Like, he had a pretty sweet setup there. And then he starts being Euron. Mouthing off. Yeah. Mouthing off, threatening to kill the warden and like all these things. And they're like, fine, then you're going to go somewhere else. And the jail that he is in now, like human rights activist groups have petitioned to have this jail closed down because of the inhumane conditions of this prison. And he's supposedly been attacked in this prison, too. He says at one point, he says that he was like shanked. Um, His wife you know, says that he was stabbed, he didn't get any medical care. Um, I would take that with a grain of salt. I'm not saying that she's a liar, but if I know anything about Yoron, and I think I do, it's that that motherfucker lies through his teeth all the time. Yeah. And I'm not saying that, like, I understand the argument for um, humane conditions. Like, I I completely understand that. And if if that is the case, I've never been to this prison. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. I don't know. But... The the fact that he had a very, very, very pleasant prison experience, he lucked out and got to go to this prison that was, by all intents and purposes, he just had to be like, you know, just, just stay inside. That's all you got to do. That's all we ask of you. Just stay in here. And then he gets transferred to somewhere that is probably somewhere where Yaron doesn't want to be. That is the definition of writing a check, like your mouth writing a check that your ass can't cash. <laughs> well, yeah, and it just goes to his character, too, of nothing's ever good enough. Um, Like, you killed somebody. I know you deny at this point that you killed Natalie, but everybody knows that you did. But the Stephanie uh, Ramirez murder... There's no question. Her body was found in his hotel room. He is seen on CCTV going into that room with her and coming out alone. And he is so depraved that after he murdered this woman, he goes downstairs and like has a snack or whatever. He goes downstairs to eat. He gets the bright idea that I'll say that I can't get in this room or whatever. I'll say I lost my key or I forget exactly what he did, but he wanted a security guard to find her because his idea was they will open the door and it 
I will have not been back in the room, right? I don't have a key, so I can't get in there. So it'll be clear that somebody else broke into this room and killed her, right? And they'll see her laying there and then, you know, whatever. And so the guy opens the door for him and she's not, her body is not visible from where this man is standing. And he's like, all right, have a nice night, sir, and blah, 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 whatever. And so that plan is foiled. And so he leaves the room again without her, of course. There's no camera footage of her ever leaving that room and then her body is found in there like there's no question dude so you are going to prison you are now in prison and you literally hit the jackpot with where you were Mm -hmm. and it wasn't you had to you had just nothing yeah nothing's ever good enough for him it's just well he's so entitled he thinks that he can he is like above board and can walk on water and all this stuff and it's like no and i i'm not mad that he got brought knocked down a bunch of pegs you know i think that it was a matter of time and it should have happened a long time ago yeah absolutely because he just it's really hard to even fathom like how depraved he is as a human being and i would love to know how involved his father actually was how complicit his father was in any of these things i really want to know i would love to know more about paulus as a person like what happened between paulus and yoran's mom Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. i want to know what kind of how he treated women and um you know, things like that, because I've heard of stories, we've talked about it, where it's like you do everything right and then boom, you have a sexual sadist for a son or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, or you are a contributing factor to that. They they learn by seeing or yeah. the nature yeah. versus nurture, nurture. situation. Absolutely. Yeah, You wonder where did this where did this come from? Where did this hatred of women come from? And where did the idea that they're not humans come from these are subhuman things that are here for my pleasure and my pleasure only and if you have the audacity to say no then you deserve Mm -hmm. to die i also think that it is really i'm so glad that he has no chance at this point of getting out of prison because he has a daughter i mean that's scary stuff yeah like absolutely um So now we've got, we're kind of to the most recent updates. Uh, So in May of 2023, Peru agreed to extradite Joran Vandersloot to the U.S. to face those charges of extortion of Beth Holloway. Um, Now that took 13 years to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, long time coming, long time coming. The strength of the Holloway family to withstand all of the things that they have had to deal with and then waiting that long for the time to come for him to face, you know, not charges for Natalie's murder. No. But at least the extortion. Um, so he initially pled not guilty. And then out of nowhere, he's just like, yeah, actually, I'm going to, I did kill Natalie Holloway. October 18th, 2023, he just, boom, yeah, I actually did do it. Um, shocked and unexpected, don't even begin to describe it. Now, Yoran's going to go on to give a confession and tell everybody what he says happened. Now, obviously, we're going to have to take that with a grain of salt because everything that comes out of this man's mouth is a fucking lie. And he has done interviews with the media where he has said exactly that. Yeah, I mean, I I give different stories all the time. And it, because every time he would give a different story, he'd get paid for that headline or whatever by these magazines and all this stuff. So he's looking at that as a way to make money. Sure. And who cares? Who cares if I tell them something this time that's not true and then I tell them something the next time? It doesn't matter to me. I'm getting paid. Well, yeah, he doesn't care, give a, care about anybody but himself. No. And so he fully admits all the time. If there's one thing that I believe that has come out of his mouth, it's that he knows he's a liar. I mean, and he doesn't care about it, you know? Yeah. So he says, 
you know, he and Natalie meet. Uh, they're really getting along at the casino. They go to the second place. They're dancing. There's footage of this. Um, Natalie seems to be having a really good time. Like, she certainly doesn't appear to be uh, in fear or anything like that. It's just, you know, a fun night out. Last night in Aruba before she goes back home. He says that he and the Calpo brothers leave with Natalie because, remember, her friends say this like they they were all going to go back to the hotel together and she says i'm going to ride with them they say they're going to drop her off and so he asks uh the calpo brothers to drop them off a little further away from the hotel and he did that on purpose everything that he does is so calculated he's a teenager at this point it's terrifying mm -hmm. but he has them drop him off drop them off further up from the hotel so that they've got to walk up the beach by themselves. Yeah, by at night. Themselves. I mean, this is very, very early in the morning. Yes. So that he has more of a chance to get laid, essentially. That's what he's trying to do. So he's trying to have them in an, in an isolated place, he says, so that he can have sex. You know, something else happens, obviously, but he says they are walking on the beach. They ended up laying down on the beach. He says they're kissing. He says, I try feeling her up and she pushed me away. No, I don't want you to do that. And he says, so I decide uh, I'm going to feel her up either way. Doesn't matter to me. I'm going to keep doing it. And she's fighting back and she's getting pissed. And so she ends up kneeing him in the crotch to get him to stop. And he says this absolutely enrages him. And he stands over her because she's still laying down. He says that he stands over her and kicks her in the head so hard that she may have already been dead just from the kick in the head. Like the amount of times that we've said, I feel like there's a third option here. Yeah. You could walk away. Honest, you could like, yeah. what? I don't believe that that's the way it happened in the first place, though, because he is recovering from being knee in the crotch, right? Which I don't have the hockey stick and pucks, but I've heard that that hurts and it takes you a little while to recover. So Natalie's just laying there waiting yeah, right. for him to recover right then he stands up she's still laying there being like hey what are we doing now and then he that d it didn't happen that way no yeah i agree then he says he has already kicked her once and maybe she's dead maybe she's not so basically i have no other choice and he picks up a cinder block that he finds on the beach and, and these this is are like the cinder blocks that you see if you went to a public school or like in a gym or something, that kind of cinder block. Right. And this stretch of beach, from what I understand, is like where people go to go to the beach. I mean, it's not like this is a tourist area. Why is there going to be a cinder block on this beach? Like, I don't know where, why the cinder block would be there. BYOC day, bring your own cinder block. I don't know. Exactly. He says that he takes that cinder block and he smashed her head with it. And he said he could see her and her face was completely caved in. And then he says he picks her body up. He walks into the water right there on the beach. He gets to knee height, knee height of water. Puts her body in the ocean. She washes right out to sea. I know we that the tide and everything can affect these things. But we have discussed this. Now, we you're way more familiar with the beach than I am. But I have been to the beach. And I have gotten in to knee deep, knee deep water. And I'll just kind of float there. But the, the waves always, it brings you further in. Mm-hmm. And then you end up at, back at the beach. The only way that I feel like you can be pushed or brought out is you have to go deeper. Yeah. Right. And, like, the alarm bells went off the very next morning. It, I, I know that things can, like, wash out to sea or whatever, but I just don't know that it would have, like, it seems like when everybody started looking, and this is a tourist area, again, there's going to be people out on the beach the next day. Mm -hmm. Nobody finds a bloody cinder block. 
No. He doesn't even mention what he does with the cinder block, but nobody finds a bloody cinder block anywhere. And the amount of searches that took place, none of this has ever been found. No evidence has ever been found. And nobody found her body. Nobody found any part of her clothing that would have been on her. Jewel, like, nothing. And not to be morbid, but nobody found any brain matter or, you know, right. blood. Nothing. That would have, yeah, that would have absolutely been in the sand. Like, it just doesn't. It doesn't add up. Matt Holloway, um, Natalie's brother, is like, I think he's full of shit. Like, I don't believe anything he says. And I also don't think for him, some of it may have happened the way that he said. I think that he did um, flip out when he was turned down. Yeah. But I have also heard that's people so say. so you're on. Exactly. But I've also heard people say that, you know, again, some of it may have happened the way that he says. But he wouldn't tell them exactly where on the beach that he actually was like he because if the Aruban authorities find evidence of this, they could charge him. Right. Like right now, Mm -hmm. it's just a confession and he's not going to be charged with it. And I don't know what the rules are in Aruba. I don't know if there's like a statute of limitations on murder and he can't be charged anyway. But I know that he has not been charged in Aruba for this. And only Aruba can charge him for the murder because it would have happened in Aruba. So jurisdiction. Yeah. Yeah. So he it just doesn't seem likely that he would actually give like, okay, yeah, and we were right there at this spot on the beach. So that's where you would need to look for evidence or around that area or whatever. It makes a lot more sense that at the very least that she was taken on a boat and dumped. Oh, absolutely. Further out. Yeah. And maybe not They weren't even on the beach when it happened in the first place or, you know, I don't know. That's what he says. Um, He walked home. He had a snack. Because that's what he does. And he watched porn. And I think completed some items on his checklist then. And then he went to sleep like nothing had happened. No, I believe that. I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. And Joran Vandersloot ended up apologizing to Natalie Holloway's family in court. He says that he's now a different person than he was then. Uh, He has found Jesus. I hope that's true. Again, if I know, know, if I know Joran like I think I do, you cannot trust him as far as you can throw him. And while these are all beautiful dreams of him making a turnaround, becoming a better person, he's still, you can apologize, you can say the words, you can say that you're different, you can say that you found God. You're still exploiting people and not giving the full truth. So if that was true, you'd back it up, but you won't. So yeah. Exactly. Beth Holloway was able to give a victim impact statement uh, in the courtroom. And she said, uh, in part, she said other things too, but she said, we do have one thing in common. You have a daughter, but mine is no longer here. What if your daughter was Natalie? What if you were me and someone bludgeoned her body then got off on porn? What would you want to do to that person? I would want to kill him. And she did say that he teared up when she mentioned his daughter. And she said, I wanted to mention two things to him because I knew that they would actually affect him because he is essentially a soulless body and things just don't affect him. So she said, I wanted to mention his daughter because I knew that would affect him. And she said, the other thing I knew would affect him is his looks because he's obsessed with the way that he looks. And Anybody who thought at the time of Natalie's disappearance that he was attractive, because I did see that in magazines and stuff like that, like kind of became a celebrity about it. And people are like, oh, he's so cute or whatever. Um, That ain't what he looks like now. I mean, he's in a hard prison. It's freaking showing. And so she said she turned around and looked at him and said, you look like hell. I don't know how you're going to make it. And she was like, I wanted that to cut him like a knife. Like. And I'm sure it did. Yeah. Um, Beth, I've watched some interviews with Beth after all this happened and the relief on her face is just evident. And I can't imagine like what a horrible situation to be in where when you find out that your child has been murdered, that brings you some relief because now you know what happened. And it's just our hearts go out to 
this family so much. I mean, the amount of pain that they've gone through and the fact that you're on Vandersloot has been playing with them for this many years. Mm -hmm. For pleasure, he thinks it's fun. Yeah. Like, and for a, a tiny little bit of money in the grand scheme of things, but still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, they say now, you know, they've at least got some answers. They don't believe everything that he said. You know, like we said, Matt, Natalie's brother was like, I mean, he's a liar. He's going to say anything he can to get attention, to get money. Um, I don't believe all the details. And he says, you know, Yoran has proved this time and time again. He changes his story all the time. Like it's always changing. Beth believes the confession. And I can understand, you know, you've you've got to be able to move on. And that's kind of what she's doing now. She says that she feels like she can move on with her life. Now she can be fully present for her son, Matt, and his children in a way that she wasn't able to do before because it was just this chapter that was never closed. Absolutely. And she has repeatedly referred to this entire situation as a never ending nightmare. And now she says that's over. She doesn't have this never ending nightmare anymore. Joran Vandersloot will serve 240 months in prison for the extortion of Beth Holloway in Peru, which will run concurrently with his current sentence for murder. And he has to pay the $25,100 back to Beth Holloway. And we'll see if anything else comes out, if he decides to release any other information or change that story again, because that's his. Uh, favorite pastime now that he's in jail and he can't do his other favorite pastimes exactly yeah you got to pivot to different hobbies once you can't do the others anymore yeah. but that is what we have so far um for natalie holloway and of course let us know what you guys think about everything yeah and if um, you haven't watched the uh hulu impact by nightline natalie holloway check it out you'll you'll see yeah. your girls on there Yes, but thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. We love you. Bye. Bye.